Hi guys, it's Sarah. I'm going to be talking about chapter 13, Expectations. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be uh, there with you today. The chapter was around being clear with, about boundaries with students, and uh, it starts with description of that there have been around 90 years of research on behavior management, and that it all comes back to the importance of writing, teaching, and reinforcing expectations within the classroom and the learning community. It, uh, Randy Sprick is one of the founders of the positive behavior movement, and much of the chapter was describing his work, and he believes that effective expectations must be designed for the majority of learning activities and transitions in the classroom. He also suggests the creation of expectations around these following two acronyms. The first was um, his work, so CHAMP refers to conversation, help, activity, movement, and participation. Uh, and he was recommending that um, expectations be set around each of sort of those variables within a classroom. However, he has also acknowledged that that is not the only um, sort of framework that you could use. And he's recommending the use of achieve, which is um, outside of his work, uh, that for older students, so that all of these variables are important. Activity, conversation, what sort of help a student gets, the integrity, effort, value, and efficiency of the work. And that again, expectations could be written around each of those variables within a classroom. He talks um, a lot about the fact that rules, expectations, and norms are not all the same, and that uh, using them interchangeably can muddy the waters. So for rules and norms, um, behave, those are for behaviors that should occur in all situations, and expectations are a suggested behavior that occurs in specific or unique situations. There were three main categories of um, sort of areas for high impact expectations, how students and others in the classroom should act, talk, and move within the course of a particular activity. So in terms of uh, the action section, that students should be um, clear on what their learning goal is, what excellent work looks like, and then what tasks the student is expected to complete. In terms of talking, um, he describes four different levels of voice. So a library voice, a voice that's a, a term as an inside voice, a conversational tone, and then he uses hockey game voice. Um, so just a, you would use the context that is most appropriate for your classroom or your school setting. So for what would be a, um, a much sort of higher decibel level of, of voice. And then the third, uh, what sort of movement is, if it is appropriate? So when, if at all, leaving seats is appropriate? Or what sort of activities are we moving around the room? And then um, what that looks like so that students understand. Each of these three things should be taught, uh, written and taught prior to expecting students to understand them. So there's a lot of uh, suggestion and sort of research around um, students having input into the creation of, of expectations. And he talks about the fact <clears throat> that when students are involved in the creation of expectations, they have more ownership or more likely to follow them. You can ask students what sort of action, talking, and movement seem appropriate when introducing a new type of task. And at Sullivan, where I used to work, we, um, our teachers had Y charts up in their rooms where students would create for each sort of section of a day or of the math block or the literacy block what would be uh, what it would look like sound like and feel like in each of those sections and then they could just be referred to non-verbally during um, a particular activity the benefits of clear expectations um, can be sort of self-explanatory but the two things that i found were most important is that teachers don't have to constantly make decisions about whether the action talk and movement are quote okay in the classroom which should uh, mean that you have fewer instances of unconscious bias. So making different um, like sort of value judgments based on the behavior of, of different students in your classroom. So again, having both teachers and students in the classroom being very clear on the expectations should allow for fewer instances of unconscious bias. I would strongly recommend that you read the bullet points on pages 310 to 312. They contain suggestions for how to involve students, what teachers' responsibilities should be in creating uh, expectations, and then how to support as a coach or principal. And then there's a section on what clear expectations look like. So again, I'd strongly recommend that um, you take a look at pages 310 to 312 on expectations. Have a lovely evening. I will miss you guys. See you next week.